<laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Let's see. Got a bunch of people in the waiting room, I guess. So let me slide over there and help them out. Whoops. What's that? Oh, yeah, we need that. Okay. Okay, where are we here? Admit all. There we go. Fourteen, I'll give that a minute and then I'll get started. While I'm waiting, does anybody have any uh, questions or issues or anything you want to raise about uh, any of the work that uh, you've been turning in or anything that we've handled thus far? I thought that the feedback on the beat sheet was really useful. Oh, good. You got that. Okay. Uh, yes, let me uh, let me raise that point really quick. So I'm trying something. Um, it's not new, but it's it's something that I uh, I haven't done in a while, which is to give audio feedback for uh, your beat sheet assignment. Um, I don't think I have a um, a workshop um, that will be able to squeeze in for the beat sheet. So I wanted to give you some feedback and just give you a sense of how you're doing with that. Um, Overall, and, and I think that written feedback um, sometimes can get a little tedious. And if there's a lot of points to be made, uh, it can become just an epic, uh, you know, email or an epic um, uh, response to your assignment that, um, you know, makes web courses uh, a little cluttered. So hopefully that is something that you guys like, and maybe I'll, I'll continue to do that uh, moving forward if it's, if it's helpful. Um, so good. That's great. That's excellent feedback. I appreciate that. Um, well, we got what 14 folks plus me. I guess I'll keep forging ahead here then. Um, okay, so let's uh, I've got some stuff to discuss with you really quick, but no big deal. Um, my I, I did have just one question about like beat sheets in general. Yeah. Uh, there was like a, uh, like a rough guideline. I'm doing air quotes, but you can't see me because I don't want my camera on because of the internet, but um, like the guideline of five beats per scene or per slug line. But like in general, like I understand like the purpose for the assignment, but right. in general, would that be the case? Because like, do we have to spend an equal amount of time in each place? I don't think that's no. necessarily. True. No, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I put out, you know, five beats per scene, um, because that seems to be at least in the uh, in the stuff that I have uh, read in the past from other students, the things that I generate on my own, um, that there tends to be you know, around five beats at least in a scene. You know, um, so I put that there as a guideline, um, and 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 the reason why is because what I what I wanted to avoid happening, and and I did see this in one case was, I had somebody who gave me a slug line for each scene, and then basically one beat, which was a a uh, sort of a um, not a synopsis, but a summary of what's happening in the scene, and that's not the point of the beat sheet. The beat sheet is to try and identify the key moments that as they occur in the action lines, they lead from one event to the next, to the next, to the next, and they lead your, your story along a smooth sort of narrative track. Right. Okay. So yeah. the notion that there might only be one beat in a scene is, is typically not the case, but there's exceptions to every rule. Like we're going to look at, um, uh, some stuff today where, you know, the establishing shot, the, um, 
the first frame that we talked about, uh, it's really just one beat because it's just an establishing shot. There's nothing else happening. Uh, it's just to show us, uh, show the audience where we are, and then we get into the next slug line. So um, there can be one beat per slug line, um, but typically there's not. There's usually more beats in a scene than you than you think there are. Um, like in a couple of the assignments, and I'm not done grading, so if you haven't gotten any feedback yet, don't be alarmed. I will. Uh, I'll get to you as soon as I can. Um, there were instances where somebody might have given me three beats in under a slug line. And as I read their beats and started really kind of deciphering what I, I what I thought was happening in their in their narrative, I realized there's more beats here than three. There's maybe five or six beats. And so then, you know, I went through and I tried to identify where I thought the the separation needed to happen and, and the item that needed to become a separate beat and and sort of you know gave that kind of feedback. So um, and, and again, I'm trying to emphasize that these are your documents. They're designed as tools to help you with your writing, but that, that doesn't advocate for using your own kind of shorthand and, and your own sort of, you know, um, uniquely developed, uh, formatting or, um, document creation in this sense, because if you were working on a TV series and you were working in a room with other writers, you have to you have to offer them standardized documents so that everybody's kind of on the same page. Everybody understands what to expect uh, in terms of a document and we can get to the information and we can utilize it as a tool that much more effectively. So we want you to have sort of a standardized approach to a beat sheet. So if you have to work in a group, you're all gonna be kind of doing the same thing. Okay, so that's... Um, sort of the subtext to all of this okay yeah for sure thank you for clarifying that yes sir uh anybody else so i'm only about a third of the way through your beat sheets at this point um so but i i'm thinking that it might be helpful to continue with the extended feedback so uh it may be worth uh taking a little extra time i should have them done by wednesday night hopefully um and I haven't I haven't uh, graded your treatments yet. I want to I want to read those more closely, but um, I don't want to be too aggressive with the grading because the treatments are really kind of your story. So if I if I see anything that's you know obviously missing, uh, I'll cite it for you. But otherwise, um, I just want to you know kind of see where you're at with your stories because that's what we're going to focus on uh, for the remainder of. Uh, this portion of the semester leading up to your uh, midterm, I'm going to call it a midterm quiz because it's really not a, an exam per se. It's not going to be this earth shattering test that you're going to have to take. Um, so if we take just a quick look at the outline, um, I want to talk to you really uh, quickly with a presentation about dialogue. And then I want to show you hopefully two uh, different pieces, but we'll see how far uh, we get after an hour and 15. Um, I've given you uh, a PDF to read. So this, uh, the role of dialogue in fiction, uh, is just sort of to give you some sense of, you know, what dialogue is about and the importance of it. I've also given you a PDF um, on a scene from uh, Mission Impossible. Uh, it's a portion of the script. Uh, it's a scene that I use actually in cinematography too, to talk to students about designing coverage for a scene in terms of the shots that you might use to comprise a scene. But I was thinking that it might also work good in terms of, uh, you know, dissecting the dialogue a little bit. Um, you've got a reading assignment from, um, I think that's maybe next uh, on Thursday. Um, yeah, scratch that. Uh, we'll try, I'll try to discuss your beat sheets maybe, maybe we can do that Thursday if I have enough of them graded. Um, I wanted you to take a crack at for an assignment for today uh, to write a short scene, maybe three or four pages focusing on a dialogue exchange. And the idea is I want to see, um, you know, what your what your notion of dialogue is and see if, if we can if we can generate something to workshop in terms of uh, creating um, realistic conversational dialogue. Um, don't go out of your way unless you want to make it part of your larger project that'll be due in two weeks 
um, you can do that. You could start with a scene from your short script or from your broadcast script, and you can use it as a foundation for that project if you want, or you can write something completely separate. That's up to you. <clears throat> okay, and on Thursday, I want to do another workshop just looking at some of your documents, and then we'll look at the Mission Impossible scene and see how that uh, plays out. Okay, so that's the um, what's in the outline uh, for class. Um, so let me go now to my quick keynote because there's only a few cells here, not much. Professor, I have one quick question. Yes. Is oh, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? No, sir. Yeah, so the thing that's due in two weeks, is our full script due in two weeks or only part of it? Um, I think if you're writing a six to eight page document, I think you can do that in two weeks, don't you? Yeah. I was just seeing what's the full script due because my story idea was an hour long um, TV episode. So I was just seeing what's the whole thing due in two weeks. Well, I, you know, I wanted to avoid that kind of a problem. So I said, um, you can make it, you know, a short scene from a larger project, um, or you can write a short, like a, you know, a web episode in six or eight pages um so if you're talking about a so are we talking about a 42 page 45 page script that you want to write um yeah i would pick you know i would pick maybe a meaty scene from that and 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 use that as your project then um and then so are you thinking that maybe that 45 page script might become your final project yes sir that's not a bad idea um yeah, so why don't we approach your problem in that with, with that sort of solution? We'll we'll get you know six to eight page scene from you as an extract from your final project, which will be ongoing from here then till the end of the semester. That'll be your last uh, assignment. Uh, is that an option where we can do for the second half of the semester continue working on our series? Well, uh, eh, you mean continue like with subsequent episodes? Yeah, something like that. I'd rather see you develop a long form document. Um, if you're if you're talking about, you know, doing a web series, for instance, and you do an episode for this project, I'd like to see you do something a little bit more long form for your final project, since I'm going to we'll, so, we'll probably work on that for the, you know, the after the midterm, I want to kind of make that a long running project. Yeah, my, my also, itch, go ahead, Sean. I also think we have different, like, I think we need to clarify what web series means because to me like like in my i i don't know if i've said this before i'm a film critic mm. uh, so for me web series now is like netflix is considered a yeah <laughs> yeah it is and unfortunately some of the texts are still approaching the problem like short form narrative um, i'm right, thinking right. short form narrative when i talk about web series Okay. So that, so that in the case of Jamaica, for instance, where she wants to write a 45 page script for her final project, we now, we now know that thanks to things like Netflix, that you can have a one hour TV series that feels long right. form. It feels like a short feature. Yeah. That um, was so in that. So sense, I think that Ben and I, I think that Ben and I are both in the same situation where we're doing like half hour comedies that would have like normally been on a television format, but are more mature and designed not to be limited by FCC guidelines. <laughs> and so I think that's what we're asking about making as the final project. Yeah, because my series, it like, there's kind of like a large overarching story that I feel like I'm not going to be able to even like touch on if I just write the first episode for my for like all everything that I do for that just talking in the first episode like I have like a, a larger overarching story that can continue on I'm just wondering if I'm able to do that for my feature or if like it's going to be the same stuff about like character dossiers and and pitches where all that stuff is going to be not even applicable because I already did it well so what kind of document do you plan on turning in then for this writing assignment just the six presumably the pilot the pilot, which you think is, is it going to be 20, 23, 24 pages? I, I can make it easily 23. It could be. Pages. I mean, you can certainly give me that if that's In, what you want, because that's I, kind I, of on the borderline, I think. 
Um, what I didn't want for the first project was like any 45 page scripts, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, but um, my, yeah. my episodes are, are planned out to be around half hour anyway. So mm -hmm. for the first script, I can easily do the pilot at 23, 24 pages. Like, honestly, right. I can, whatever you want the page number can, to be, I can do that. Right. So like mine is six 30 minute episodes. So I was theoretically thinking in my mind that midterm would be the first pilot episode, the 22 pages. And then the end project would be the 120 pages of the whole series. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, we really do need to, cons uh, to consider that so given the Netflix um, model now. Um, the, the main concern I had was just like working on the pitch and on the premise and on the character dossiers and on the beat sheets, having all this stuff figured out for the backstory and then the overarching story and the hero's journey and then not actually being able to do that in one single episode because it's part of a larger series. Well, that's kind of why I wanted six to eight pages to begin with, you know, maybe 14 at the outset for the first writing project. Are um, we talking about the first writing the, project? The one that I'm asking, I'm going to ask you to have due by the end of week seven, which is two weeks okay. today. Right, right. So, I, I was making sure, like, I'm not going to have the 22-page yeah. pilot done in two days. Like, Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> the one that I wanted to see you do for Thursday was something that, uh, just a thumbnail that basically we can, if we, if we had time to workshop it, we could start talking about, um, you know, how your dialogue is flowing and, and, you know, and get a sense of, you know, what your idea of dialogue is. And I'm going to show you a couple of things today too, and we can talk about it. Well, um, so in your, in your case, um, so I think the other question is what are the assignments for the second half going to look like? That's are exactly what I was going to ask. Are they going to be the same thing over again? Like the character dossiers, the pitches, et cetera, et cetera? Kind of, yeah. Um, so I think that you can still apply those things in the second portion of, uh, of the semester because you, you can add characters to your concepts. You can add, uh, you know, you may have different antagonists in each, chap in each episode of your series. I don't know how they're structured. So I think there's room for, for that sort of thing uh, to continue to generate documents for your projects. And if you're more inclined to write episodic content, if you're thinking about um, the Netflix model where we have multiple episodes of a theme rather than one-offs, um, single stories, um, then for the first project, you know, you can give me the first, you know, right half of your pilot for instance you don't have to give me 23 pages for the first yeah. i just i just know speaking project. for myself like just personally i'm trying to use this as like a portfolio building class yeah exactly and um i already have three feature screenplays in mm -hmm. my portfolio okay and so i wanted to try to do something different that i didn't have which would be sure. i'm down with that if you know if you've already got this kind of thing going on that's terrific so for anybody who doesn't have that kind of content created yet, um, we'll follow the format of giving me sort of a TV project in the beginning or a short broadcast narrative and then give me a longer form project for the end. But if you're already generating that kind of content, if you're already surely and, and squarely on a writing uh, path at this point and you've already got a feature written, um, then that's fine or, you know, you can write another, you know, portion of a feature or a scene from uh, a feature that maybe you're planning on doing if you want to get some feedback on that. I'll, I'll remain open because what I want this to be is, um, and, and you've pointed it out uh, very, very eloquently, is I want this to be a portfolio building opportunity for you. So I don't want you to be building redundant materials if you've already got that kind of thing to show. So I'll work with you. It's just a question of you tell me what is going to help you the best and we'll kind of shoehorn that into whatever the assignment structure is. Okay. Okay. Yes. Nice. Natalie. Hi. Okay. So I was wondering, cause um, like all my assignments have been like on the project of uh, the cold stone, which I showed you guys. Uh -huh. So I was thinking about it, uh, doing it as a series before like a TV show. But now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like I want this idea to be a feature film instead of a, of a 
show, like a TV show. So what I was wondering is that if for my final project, I could take this idea and write it down like to a feature film script. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. I mean, and so- And of course for the midterm, like have at least like uh, the first uh, few scenes, like the very first scenes. Or c- continue on your thought as a, as a, as a webisode and then restructure it for your second writing project. Oh. Um, so that you have it kind of both ways and you can see it okay. both ways and you could pitch it both ways if it ends up being a viable uh, you know, document and, and you really like where it's going. Because presumably and yes. hopefully documents that you create in this class, you might wanna revisit after this class and continue working those problems into yes. You know, really, really polished, uh, finished work that you can put in a portfolio and show a prospective client. Okay, so yeah, that works. Thank you. You could do that. You know, yeah. um, maybe what we we should plan on doing is is maybe having some you know one on one Zoom sessions with uh, any of you that have this sort of um, you know issue uh, looming on the horizon, and, and we'll make sure that we have a plan for you. Um, but I want this to work out, you know, to your benefit in that respect. So uh okay anyone else uh have an issue to raise before i get started not an issue but just so i could like make sure i got it right so for the thing that's doing two weeks for my pilot of my tv series about 10 to 15 pages and then build on that build on my characters and then the rest of it for the final um you don't have to give me a whole series for the final but But you're saying that your your episodes are like 45 pages Yes, sir. Yeah. So give me, you know, give me a, a strong scene from in your one hour uh, narrative. It could be the opening scene or the opening few scenes, you know, um, so I can see how you're you're constructing your document. I can see how your story's flowing. I can look at your dialogue. I can look at your mechanics, like your, your formatting and stuff. And then, yeah, give me the, the, the full episode for your final project. That would be fine. Um, I'm not going to put, you know, that many, you know, I'm going to make, not going to make that many pages a requirement. Um, I might, you know, say, give me, you know, 20 or 30 pages for your final written assignment. And if you happen to be writing a 45 page document, you know, that's fine. Um, I, like I said, I want this to work for you. So, uh, and it sounds like you got a, a good idea. And so, you know, let's, let's work that problem and see what kind of content we can get out of you. That's, uh, that'll be fun, I think. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the last half of the semester, how I wanted to deal with that was I wanted to take like, you know, the Vogler model, the story structure model, and, you know, each week kind of look at your final project in that context. You know, what's your journey? What's your character? You know, what are your character's uh, goals and wounds and all of that? And really start to drill down on a, on a long form concept. Now, if you're pulling the same kind of characters over from series work into your long form work, um, then you can regenerate those documents for new characters or for supporting characters. Uh, you can do it that way, um, just to show me how your, your, your concept is evolving, okay? And I'll put the outline up uh, probably, probably next week for the rest of the semester, okay? All right. Well, then let's have a chat about dialogue. And here's the thing about dialogue is, um, you know, this can be a rabbit hole. I think you could do a whole course on just on narrative dialogue. So I'm only really going to be able to scratch the surface. And a lot of this is going to depend on the effort that you put into your own work and the explorations that you do, the questions that you raise and the opportunities that you take to workshop your material with your classmates to get some feedback Um, because there's just you know (laughs) there's just not enough time to treat this as a master's class in dialogue for narrative so uh, we'll do what we can Um, okay i discussed this with you already from the outline so i want to give you a a thought uh, from the lahush agri dramatic writing text which is dialogue is the chief means by which the premise is proved. Now, here's an interesting point, because from your character dossiers on the first page, I asked you to restate your premise from your concept. And a lot of you gave me 
a synopsis. You didn't give me a premise. Okay. And so it's very important that you understand the notion and the difference between a premise and a plot. Okay. Because they are two different things. Okay. And so I'm trying to think of, you know, maybe an example of something that I've looked at already, but you know, if you give me a premise, you know, uh, man has to save the town from uh, invading aliens and at the same time he has to learn how to reconcile his past with his father or whatever okay that's more of a plot or a synopsis than it is a, a premise okay so you have to you have to look at that idea that story idea that you've given me and you have to sort of scratch out or tease out the theme that is being illustrated by your plot okay so if it's simply a story about um you know uh people have to learn how to conquer um invading aliens right um you know the themes you know what are the themes that might undergird a plot like that you know the themes might be um you know dealing with your fear of the unknown okay if 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 a if an alien race is invading the planet earth they're definitely not a known quantity right so an underlying theme and there could be multiple premises to your story now there there doesn't have to be just one okay so one possible theme might be you know dealing with the unknown facing uh the unknown right um what might be you know some other themes to that concept you know you have to sort of think about your characters that's why you know you're being asked to think about your protagonist with an inner journey and an outer journey because a lot of times the inner journey points to the premise of of the story okay um and we can talk about that more on uh on uh thursday if you want and and if you have a a dossier you want to workshop we can we can look at it okay um but there were a number of times when i felt like what you were really giving me was a plot line not a premise and if you recall i gave you a pdf document early on in this semester which was a whole list of uh suggested themes or uh, premises for stories okay so you might want to look at that document again and see see how the phrasing looks and see how it feels you know to read the premises off that document and then look at what you gave me on your dossiers again and hopefully you can see the difference and then i've given each of you where i felt like there was a problem with your premise i gave you some feedback in that direction on your homework assignment so um check it out again because dialogue as uh, lahush agri is saying is the chief means by which we prove our premise in our story the characters uh, revealed and the conflict that is carried out. Okay. It's vital that the dialogue be good <laughs> since it is the part of the film, which is the most apparent It's the outward facing presentation to the audience. Okay. The subtext is derived. Um, subtext is um, sometimes rhetorical, um, um, but it's certainly not obvious and it's not necessarily stated uh, in the dialogue or exhibited in the action by the characters in a film. So subtext is something we have to sort of, it's hinted at and then we have to figure it out as, as we, as we watch, as we experience the story. Um, so the only thing laying on the surface is, uh, demonstrated action and dialogue. Okay. Dialogue must reveal character should reveal character. Every speech should be the product of the speaker's three dimensions, telling us what he is and hinting at what he'll do, okay? I'm the one who knocks. I'm using that sort of example from Breaking Bad. Is there anyone here that hasn't seen Breaking Bad? Jamaica hasn't, Natalia hasn't. I, you know, in truth, I hadn't seen it either until a few weeks ago. Um, I just never had the time uh, or the inclination. Um, but, you know, one of the beauties of quarantine is you can get caught up on all your binge watching. So uh, Breaking Bad was one of the shows on my list of things to watch because it had been so critically acclaimed and P 
people, you know, in my social circles spoke highly of it, and it's been used in other academic uh, resources and uh, as an example of what, you know, of good writing. So I was like, heck, I'll watch it, right? And so it is quite good. So um, what we have is a character who begins his arc as a apparently non-complex, emasculated, you know, um, suburban white male teacher, family man, um, pretty, pretty vanilla on the outside. Um, but what we find is we start learning that he has issues of insecurity, he has issues of inferiority, he has issues of victimization. Um, and those subtextual character traits, those inner journeys that he's working on, start coming out and becoming outward expressions of his evolution and frustration. Um, he goes from being you know, truly a nice guy to truly being a bad guy who's wrestling with the realization that he has somehow evolved from the good guy to the bad guy. Um, and so in the scene where he says, I'm the one who knocks, he's responding to in an argument to his wife about the, the wife is concerned that bad elements and, and bad people are going to uh, who he is interacting with freely are going to find out where he lives and who his family is and they're going to come and they're going to harm his family in in a in an effort to deal with him and how he's behaving or to you know extract revenge on him for some action that he's taken and his wife doesn't really have a clue of the depth of what he has become because he's kept it a secret from his family and from his extended family for the entire series for the most part until almost the end. Um, and in this argument, in a moment of frustration where he is so tired of keeping all of his alter ego bottled up, uh, you know, he admits to his wife that he says, you know, you keep worrying and I keep telling you not to worry that you're not in any danger and you keep obsessing about someone who's going to knock at the door and do you harm and he says you really don't know who you're dealing with here I'm not the victim I'm not the one who gets shot answering the front door I'm the one who knocks right so he's trying to tell his wife back off I'm dealing with some stuff on the inside that you don't know about that I'm trying to keep from you both because I don't want to talk about it. And I'm also trying to tell you if you don't, you don't, you can't be held accountable for what you don't know. You know, I'm a, I've become a bad guy, but I don't want to tell you about it because then you'll have to bear the weight of my, my sins as well. Um, so all of that kind of context can be, you know, derived from a brief and heated exchange between the husband and the wife. If you've, if you've seen his arc over the first, um, you know, three seasons and you see how he is, you know, what he's turning into, uh, the actions were proven in the storyline. You know, he's, he's a chemist teacher and he turns into a drug dealer. And, uh, you know, in a brief dialogue exchange, we start getting a real sense of how he's starting to embrace his bad side. Um, so I thought it was a pretty cool scene. So I kind of used it as just a, a thumbnail here to sort of kick the conversation off. Um, I wanted to look at um, this scene called Say My Name. It's from season five, episode seven. And I have, or I've uploaded for you uh, up the portion of the script that deals with it or um, it's really not a script. It's a, it's a transcript. So it's, it's missing, I think, some of the action lines, um, but not many. Um, but I'll start with something that I have all the documents for, which is uh, the coin toss scene from No Country for Old Men. Has anybody here not seen No Country for Old Men? I've spoken about it a little bit. I'm going to show you that scene. And then I'm, I'm going to, I want to read to you from the novel that scene. Then I want to show you the scene and then I want to show you the script. And hopefully you'll get a sense of how a script is derived from a written document like a novel, um, the types of things that are in the novel and the types of things that are not present in the script. And then have you look at the action and see how the filmmakers arrived at the final conclusion 
with visuals and, and everything else. Okay. I'm going to save this for the last thing that I talk about, which is product placement. It's in the dialogue from Breaking Bad. Um, but since I'm going to show you no country uh, first, uh, I'll save that uh, for a little bit later. Um, these couple of videos here, I'm going to, I'm not going to screen with you here in class. I want you to just go ahead and check them out at your leisure because they're like 15, uh, 16 minutes long. Um, one is um, an extract from uh, Inglorious Bastards, uh, a closer look at how to write great dialogue. Okay. And then um, this fellow who I look at a lot of his videos because I am also a novelist. Um, this is Barry Jenkins and he has a really great website with a lot of um, tutorials and things on writing narratives for um, long form like novels and, and stories and stuff. Um, and he has some advice uh, for you about compelling dialogue as well. Uh, his approach to creating dialogue, and I thought you might find it interesting to hear, um, because dialogue in a novel and dialogue in a screenplay, um, they can resemble one another or they can sound completely different. And you have a lot more freedom in a novel than you have in a screenplay. Okay, so I think screenplay dialogue can be a little bit more restrictive even than what you'll see in a novel. Okay. So I thought it'd be interesting for you to hear that approach as well. Um, your homework will be, uh, as I uh, discussed with you, a quick, you know, three, four pages of written dialogue. If you use um, uh, your final draft uh, uh, application, man, you're going to see three or four pages of written dialogue will take you like not long at all. Okay. Um, because the indents are so close together, right? And you're not really using much of the total page at all. So it's not like writing pages of an essay or pages of, uh, you know, any other form of document, like your treatments even. Um, all the indents and all the spacing and all that stuff, three or four pages doesn't account for much at all in terms of writing. Um, so don't be daunted by that size uh, in terms of the assignment. I just want to see an effective demonstration of a dialogue exchange that you might be thinking about in one of your other projects. This is a snippet now. It's not a, it's not a complete project. It's not a complete thought necessarily. Um, I just want to hear you construct a dialogue exchange and so that we can talk about it. Okay. All right. So let's see. How do I want to approach the no country for old men issue here? How about? Let's see, I've got, uh, here's the script highlighted. Ah, yes, I have the, um, yes, okay. So let me start with the, the novel, okay? As written by Cormac McCarthy in the book, right? So if you had the paper book in your back pocket and you were sitting in the park and you were gonna read this scene from the novel, this is what it, this is what it is. Um, I'll pull it out a little too, so you can sort of follow along, but I'll read it out loud for you. And I want you to pay attention to the construct, you know, see how it sounds to your ear. And then we'll look at the clip from the movie. So he crossed the Pecos River just north of Sheffield, Texas, and took Route 349 south. When he pulled into the filling station at Sheffield, it was almost dark. A long red twilight with doves crossing the highway heading south towards some ranch tanks. He got changed from the proprietor and made a phone call and filled the tank and went back in and paid. You all getting any rain up your way, the proprietor said. Which way would that be? I seen you was from Dallas. Sugar picks up his change off the counter and what business it of is yours and what business is it of yours where I'm from, friendo? I didn't mean nothing by it. You didn't mean nothing by it. I was just passing the time of day. I guess that passes for manners in your cracker view of things. Well, sir, I apologized. If you don't want to accept my apology, I don't know what else I can do for you. How much are these, sir? I said, how much are these? 69 cents. Shigur folded a dollar onto the counter. The man rang it up and stacked the change before him the way a dealer places chips. Shigur hadn't taken his eyes from him. The man looked away and he coughed. Shigur opened the plastic package of cashews with his teeth and doled a third of the, 
a third part of them into his palm and stood eating. Will there be something else, the man said. I don't know, will there? Is there something wrong? With what? With anything. Is that what you're asking me? Is there something wrong with anything? The man turned away and put his fist to his mouth and coughed again. He looked at Shigeru and looked away. He looked at the window uh, out the front and, uh, of the store. He saw the gas pumps. He saw the car sitting there. Shigeru ate another small handful of cashews. Will there be anything else? You've already asked me that. Well, I need to see about closing. See about closing? Yes, sir. What time do you close? Now, we close now. Now's not a time. What time do you close? Generally around dark, at dark. Shigur stood slowly chewing. You don't know what you're talking about, do you? Sir? I said, you don't know what you're talking about, do you? I'm talking about closing. That's what I'm talking about. What time do you go to bed, sir? You're a bit deaf, aren't you? I said, what time do you go to bed? Well, I'd say around 9.30, somewhere around 9.30. Sugar poured more cashews into his palm. I could come back then, he said. We'll be closed then. That's all right. Well, why would you come back? Why would you be coming back? We'll be closed. You said that. Well, we will. You live in that house behind the store? Yes, I do. You've lived there all your life? The proprietor took a while to answer. This was his wife's father's place, he said originally. You married into it? He lived in Temple, Texas for many, we lived in Temple, Texas for many years, raised a family there in Temple. We come out here about four years ago. You married into it, if that's the way you want to put it. I don't have some way to put it. That's the way it is. Well, I need to close now. Shigur poured the last of the cashews into his palm and waited the wadded the little bag and placed it on the counter. He stood oddly erect, chewing. You seem to have a lot of questions, the proprietor said, for somebody that don't want to say where he's from. What's the most you ever lost in a coin toss, sir? I said, what's the most you ever lost in a coin toss? Coin toss? Coin toss. I don't know, folks don't generally bet on a coin toss. It's usually more like just to settle something. What's the biggest thing you ever saw settled? I don't know. Shigur took a 25 cent piece from his pocket and flipped it spinning into the bluish glare of the fluorescent lights overhead. He caught it and slapped it on the back of his forearm just above the bloody wrappings. Call it, he said. Call it? Yes. For what? Just call it. Well, I need to know what we're calling here. How would that change anything? The man looked at Shigur's eyes for the first time, blue as lapis, at once glistening and totally opaque like wet stones. You need to call it, Shigur said. I can't call it for you. It wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be even right. Just call it. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. You know what the date is on this calling? No, it's 1958. It's been traveling around 22 years to get here. And now it's here and I'm here and I've got my hand over it, and it's either heads or tails, and you have to call it. I don't know what it is I stand to win. In the blue light, the man's face was beaded thinly with sweat. He licked his upper lip. You stand to win everything, Shigur said, everything. You ain't making any sense, mister. Call it. Heads then. Shigur uncovered the coin. He turned his arm slightly to the man to see. Well done, he said. He picked the coin from his wrist and handed it across. What do I want with that? Take it. It's your lucky coin. I don't need it. Yes, you do. Take it. The man took the coin. I got to close now, he said. Don't put it in your pocket. Sir, don't put it in your pocket. Where do you want me to put it? Don't put it in your pocket. You won't know which one it is. All right. Anything can be an instrument, Shigur said. Small things, things you wouldn't even notice. They pass from hand to hand. People don't pay attention. And then one day there's an accounting. And after that, nothing is the same. Well, you say it's just a coin. For instance, nothing special there. What could that be an instrument of? You see the problem. To separate the act from the thing, as if the parts of some moment in history might be interchangeable with the parts of some other moment. How could that be? Well, it's just a coin, yes. 
That's true, it is. Shiger cupped his hand and scooped his change from the counter into the palm and put the change in his pocket and turned and walked out the door. The proprietor watched him go, watched him get into the car. The car started and pulled off from the gravel apron onto the highway. The lights never did come on. He said the coin on the count, he laid the coin on the counter and looked at it. He put both hands on the counter, just stood there leaning there with his head bowed. Okay, that's basically the end of the scene. All right. So what we have in the novel is a bunch of stuff that now I want to show you the clip and I want you to see if you can pick out the differences readily from uh, what they did in the film. Let's see, where did I hide that? <laughs> I think I got it hidden here. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that screen? Okay, everybody. Okay. How much? Sixty-nine cent. And the gas. Y'all getting any rain up here, boy? What way would that be? I've seen you was from Dallas. What business is it of you? Where I'm from? Friendo. I didn't mean nothing by it. Didn't mean nothing. Just passing the time. If you don't want to accept that, I don't know what else I can do for you. Will it be something else? I don't know. Will there? Is something wrong? With what? With anything. Is that what you're asking me? Is there something wrong with anything? Will it be anything else? You already asked me that. Oh, well, I need to see about closing. Mm, see about closing? Yes, sir. What time do you close? Now. We close now. No, it's not a time. What time do you close? Generally around dark. At dark. You don't know what you're talking about, do you? Sir? I said, you don't know what you're talking about. What time do you go to bed? Sir? You're a bit deaf, aren't you? I said, what time do you go to bed? Oh, uh, somewhere around 9.30, I'd, I'd say around 9.30. I could come back then. Why would you be coming back? We'll be closed. Yeah, you said that. Well, I got to close now. You live in that house all back? Yes, I do. You lived here all your life? This is my wife's father's place originally. <laughs> you married into it? We lived in Temple, Texas for many years. Raised a family there in Temple. We come out here about four years ago. You married into it. That's the way you want to put it. I don't have some way to put it. That's the way it is. The most you ever lost on a coin toss. Sir? The most you ever lost on a coin toss. I don't know. I can say. Call it. What? Just call it. Well, we need to know what we're calling it for here. You need to call it. I can't call it for you. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know. You know what date is on this coin? No. 1958. It's been traveling 22 years to get here. And now it's here. And it's either heads or tails. And you have to say, call it. Well, look, I need to know what I stand to win. Everything. How's that? You stand to win everything, call it. All right. 
heads in. Well done. Don't put it in your pocket, sir. Don't put it in your pocket. It's your lucky water. Where do you want me to put it? Anywhere not in your pocket. Or it'll be mixed in with the others and become just a coin. Which it is. Okay. So, <clears throat> any immediate thoughts on what you just saw? Anything at all? It's very similar to the way the novel was. They didn't really change that much. They didn't change that much? You think it's pretty close to the same thing that I read to you? Mostly. I can tell you what they did do. They took the dialogue verbatim from the novel. That's for sure. But did you notice anything about the dialogue? I found it that whenever they, in the film, the natural pauses made the scene more intense. So if I was reading it, I wouldn't have read it with those pauses. So like I wouldn't have got the same reaction reading it versus seeing it. It's kind of interesting, yeah, and, and I think that gets to the point that I'm that I'm going to make here, which is, if you look at the novel and you look at um, the way the dialogue is structured in the novel, okay, it's kind of following uh, AP style, which is actually a journalistic um, uh, set of guidelines, which says that we separate quotes in a column uh, from the narrative of the text. So if you're writing a news story, for instance, about a bank robbery, and then you have a, 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 a quick interview with a man on the street, what did you see? And then the man recounts what, what he saw uh, as the robbery transpired. Anything the man on the street says in quotes would be given its own sort of lines, its own paragraph or lines, okay? Be separated out from the rest of the details from the story. And they're kind of doing the same thing in the novel with the dialogue or the, or the speaking parts of the characters. It's all sort of stretched out line by line, okay? Each time there's an exchange and the other person speaks, it goes to a new line. So it ends up getting stretched out like this. And yeah, it's kind of hard to see where the pauses might occur unless you consider that perhaps uh, a question mark will have a, a pause after it, whereas a period uh, in a declarative sentence might not have a pause. So you might, in your interpretive read of this document, you might put some dramatic pauses in um, as license, creative license, because you're the one now who's performing the document and in your interpretation, there's a dramatic pause after a question mark, but we don't really know. Um, the thing that I notice uh, immediately is that they've juxtaposed many of the lines of the dialogue and they've dropped many of the lines of the dialogue from the novel. I suspect that the reason they did that was to tighten up the scene dramatically in terms of a visual experience and to get at the kernel of the conflict quicker. So in the beginning of this scene, we've got a lot of description of the gas station, the time of day. Um, and then we have, you know, what did Shigur do? Well, he pumped some gas. First he went in and he got some change. He made some calls. Then he pumped some gas and then he came in to pay the proprietor. And then we get this back and forth, back and forth. And there's, you know, there's a little bit of action. There's a little bit of this sort of description going on, but it's a lot of this back and forth, back and forth. And we go that way for several pages until we start really getting to the meat of the conflict, which is when Shiger realizes that this guy is, is uh, he's been living his life kind of with his head in the sand. And, and as we've discussed before, we're starting to figure out, and this is kind of in the beginning of this movie, we're starting to figure out that Anton Shiger is a, is a, a metaphor for death. We're starting to feel like this guy is much more than just your average bad guy. 
that he's more of um, the human embodiment of, of the death analog, right? So when Shiger decides that he's going to flip the coin for this guy, uh, it's a it's a culminating moment for the station manager, but it's you know it's <laughs> it's just another uh, event in a series of events that unfolds as Anton Shiger's um, storyline, right? He's just another guy that Anton encounters and decides whether he needs to live or die. So I think they're trying to get to that part of the conflict really quick and sort of raise the tension. They give you a few of the lines uh, initially to sort of reinforce the, the humdrum nature of the station manager's life and sort of the, the reaction that Shigur has to that, which is sort of ridiculous surprise at how oblivious this guy is to the fact that there's a big wide world out there. His world seems to have existed only from a couple of towns very close uh, in 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 uh, proximity to one another, and that his notion of the the world uh, writ large is 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 fairly nebulous, if if existent at all. And Anton Chigurh represents the larger world coming down to his particular branch to roost for a while. In, in other words, get a tank of gas. Um, and so this guy, you know is so we we get some of that simple dialogue back and forth to sort of establish that feel of who the station manager is but then they get right into the conflict and the conflict is is, is anton going to shoot this guy or not and the conflict you know in terms of the story is is this man going to have lived in obscurity and then die in obscurity or is he going to make the right call on the coin toss and win win his life back get a second chance at um his life and doing something with it as opposed to whittling frittering it away in a gas station in the middle of the stockton plateau which is a very desolate place if you've ever been there <clears throat> so they juxtapose some of the lines of dialogue they've dropped quite a few of the lines of dialogue that seem to be a little bit more revealing of what the point is um, and there's certainly, now I want to show you this, uh, a copy of the screenplay or the version I pulled off of uh, uh, IMDSB, which is the Internet Movie Script Database, um, and show you what that looks like. Okay. Certainly, at the very end, you should see <laughs> there's quite a bit of difference between this whole diatribe that Shiger gives him at the end and what was actually said in the film. So here's the script now. So here's our slug line, exterior gas station, grocery, Sheffield day. They specify the town, I guess, because the movie kind of becomes a road movie and they go from uh, Temple, Texas, Sheffield, they, they kind of move around on the map and it's sort of illustrating how Shiger is chasing this bag of money across Texas. An isolated dusty crossroad, it's twilight, the Ford sedan that Shiger stopped is parked alongside the pump. That's our opening image, right? So it's pretty similar to what we got in the video. The video was simply this. It was simply the, the shot of the gas station. Here's Shiger's car. That's it. Now, in the novel, it says it's almost dark. In the film, it doesn't really look particularly dark. Um, and there's shadows that might indicate that it's maybe maybe five in the afternoon, five, maybe six o'clock in the afternoon, depending on the time of year. Um, but it certainly doesn't look like it's close to dark. So I thought that was a little bit of a stretch. Um, let me get rid of this now. Interior gas station grocery day. Shigur stands at the counter across from the elderly proprietor. He holds up a bag of cashews. So we went right to the cashews where in the novel, the cashews happen, you know, maybe, you know, there's several lines before he asks them how much the cashews are. Uh, and then we get the dialogue exchange. How much? 69 cents, this and the gas. Y'all getting any rain up your way. So this was the first line in the novel. Now it's way down here. It's four lines into the scene after our opening image. Now he asks them, are we getting any rain up your way? Um, so I think what they're doing is they juxtapose some of this, 
uh, dialogue so they could get to the notion of the coin flip a little bit more quickly visually, right? So whereas in the novel, you have time to kind of explain all of that. Well, he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a quarter and, you know, all of this stuff. Instead, you know, the money exchange is already happening, which facilitates a coin toss. And there's a, there's a specific difference between the coin toss in the film and the coin toss in the book. Do you remember the coin, the coin toss in the book? He says he flips the coin into the air and he catches it on his arm, revealing bloody bandages and all kinds of other stuff, right? So they didn't, they chose not to do that in the film though. They chose not to have him flip it and put it on his arm and reveal any bloody bandages and things like that. They just had him flip it onto the counter. So do you have any feeling about why they might've done that? Since film is a visual medium, it, it makes it more tense that way. Maybe. Um, it's pretty immediate. They do that in an insert. They get the, the coin on the counter, slapping onto the counter. Logistically speaking, I'm not sure that, you know, flipping the coin and catching it on his arm would have been um, as sort of shocking or sort of abrupt it also might have been as far as mechanics and dexterity it might have been a challenge um, but there was also a reason why we saw the coin flip in the book we saw that anton already had bloody bandages on his arm which would be some kind of indication of you know that this guy has already been through some kind of event and it was you know violent and he's bleeding from it um, but in the movie, since this is only, I think, the third scene in the film, uh, we have seen Shigur kill a cop already, and we have seen him kill uh, the guy who he took the station wagon from. And we've been introduced to Llewellyn, and we have heard from the sheriff in the opening. Um, so we've kind of heard from all the main characters in the film right now, and we've seen Shigur now kill two people and he's into this coin toss thing. So they're kind of trying to establish what kind of character this guy is, but I think they don't want to get wrapped up in the minutia of having to explain bandages and blood right away. Uh, and they want to get to the crux of this other metaphorical issue, which is that he's really representing the randomness of life and the, um, and the metaphorical uh, example of death right that that death is coming for all of us and and you know we're living in the world and we're doing our thing and then here here comes the randomness of that whole act of flipping the coin and calling it does, does he live or does he die right there's all these sort of metaphorical themes going on here in this scene okay this scene could almost be thought of as a you know as a as a metaphor for the entire film really I mean, because the coin flip is as random for the shop owner as finding the bag of money was for Llewellyn, who was simply out hunting. And then this random thing happens and it throws his life into a serious existential conflict, right? And he chose wrong, Llewellyn chose wrong. The shopkeeper was lucky, he got lucky and chose the right thing, which was he called heads and he got to live tails he was going to get his head blown off by the the air gun <laughs> right so it's interesting how they whittled away everything that they could from the novel and there's very little in terms of um action lines here either the action lines are kind of uh indented to the left and this was a really poor copy off of uh imdsb um the dialogue is supposed to be notably indented at about space 40, I think. And I think action lines are only indented at like space 19 on a typewriter. So uh, all of the formatting was totally uh, poor in uh, the copy that I got off of the internet. Um, but you can see there's very little in the way of action lines here. Shigur stands at the counter. Shigur tears open the bag of cashews. 
a beat. Uh, Shigur stands chewing. The proprietor turns and coughs. The proprietor looks at him uncomfortably. That's pretty much it, you know? They they took the, you know, like I said, they took the dialogue verbatim from the actual film or from the actual novel, but they just eliminated certain lines that they felt weren't working for the story and then rearranged, rearranged what was left to get at the conflict very quickly. So this is kind of a, an example of adaptation in addition to just kind of looking at dialogue and seeing how you feel about it. Um, do you have any thoughts about the dialogue in particular? Does it feel, you know, how do you feel about the dialogue? I don't know if it's just me, but with the dialogue that was going on, if I did not know the basis of this film, I feel like someone could use this dialogue in another genre in a way. So let's say an example would be like, if it was like a comedy and someone just put like a laugh track behind almost everything that, um, I can't even pronounce his name, that Tiger. Tiger. Yeah, sure. if someone's put like a laugh track behind everything he said, I could see someone like laughing at it because like what he's saying is making no sense. But then in this genre, I'm giving more of a suspense feel if you're trying to figure out what is he talking about and what he's trying to do. So are you saying that you might find Shiger's lines humorous or the proprietor's lines humorous? The more Shiger and the prior's, um, the way he's speaking back to him. Like he was saying, he was like, heads or tails. And he was like, I don't know what I'm betting on and stuff like that. Yeah. It's interesting too, that phonetically they, they only give you a couple of clues in the text, either in the novel or in the script that the proprietor has any kind of accent, you know, y'all is definitely phonetically a, an indicator of, um, of, uh, you know, having a, a an accent. Um, yes, sir, as one word instead of yes, sir, yes, sir is also sort of a, an indicator there that he might have some kind of um, some kind of accent. But otherwise, you know, in Shiger's case, or the proprietor's case, I, you know, I think the dialogue is pretty much open to interpretation as far as, you know, if they really wanted to, you know, crack her up that dialogue for the proprietor. So we really kind of talk with some kind of Texas country accent, you know, that's all the kind of thing that really becomes a collaboration between the actors and the director. And it's not really so much mentioned in the dialogue. So in this scene, there's not a whole lot of context in the dialogue for what's going on. So I think in, in that sense, you, you, you may be very right about the notion that, you know, this dialogue could very well end up in some other kind of uh, piece of work uh, because there's very little here to indicate what's going on. And I guess the reason why I'm, I'm trying to show you this is to give you some sense of how kind of threadbare uh, a script can be in other words, in each line of this dialogue, we're not getting any parentheticals that are describing how any of these characters are feeling in that moment. Like there's no parentheticals that are indicating the proprietor's uncomfortable. There are no parentheticals. Like for instance, when in the film, when Shiger asks the guy, do you live in the house out back? And the guy says, yes. And he says your whole life. And he says, no, we moved here from, from Temple. And 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 this was my father-in-law's place before us and Shiger chokes and then he says you married into it well that's not in the novel and it's not in the script either so that's something that just sort of happened in the process of the director and the actor thinking about how would this guy respond to the news that this poor fellow has you know married into the situation and that was kind of you know the best he could do and, and so he came up with the idea of maybe gagging on the peanuts, you know, like maybe that was a moment where uh, Shiger can't really believe what he's hearing. And that's interesting because the character of Shiger in, in all other aspects in the movie is pretty deadpan. We don't get much in the way of emotional indication from this guy. He's sort of robotic. He's very wooden. He just goes about his business of killing people, you know. 
Um, so it's one of those rare moments when he actually chokes on the peanuts that give us any sort of idea at all that this guy has, you know, maybe it's a sense of humor that he's laughing at the proprietor or it's just shocking disbelief. Um, and he's reacting to it with a knee jerk response, but it's kind of interesting, you know, cause that's not in uh, either of the documents. So the idea that, you know, when you're preparing your dialogue, the dialogue's not revealing how people feel or how they think. And it's not, um, it's not telling us about the story that's taking place. So in other words, in the novel, we get this whole, this whole thing. It's two paragraphs of Anton talking about the significance of the coin toss. But in the script, at the end, he just says, well done when the guy picks heads. And he says, don't put it in your pocket. It's your lucky coin. Uh, if you do that, you might forget, you know, what it is or what it means, he says. And you might think it's just a regular coin, which it is. And then he walks out of the room, right? So we're forced, if we've, if we've never read the novel and we've only seen the movie, we're forced to do all that mental work of figuring out what the significance of this scene was. And so in consequential uh, scenes in the film, when we start seeing it get more and more violent, we start seeing Chigurh's process, um, we start to kind of really understand, that's when we start to really grasp the gravity of what the proprietor had going on at the gas station and how lucky he was to get away because everybody else that Chigurh came in contact with was killed except Tommy Lee Jones, but they never actually met. They only sort of cross paths, you know, but they never met. So uh, Tommy Lee Jones uh, isn't killed by Chigurh uh, and neither is the proprietor. Everybody else dies. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and they're not trying to explain to you what's going on. They're, the two, the Cohen brothers wrote the script. They adapted it from the novel and they were trying to be very, um, very uh, um, true to the original written work. So they didn't embellish the dialogue at all. They used what they wanted from it and they took it verbatim. What they didn't use ended up either on the cutting room floor or they never even shot it. Uh, we, we won't, we'll never know that part. Um, but it's not they're not trying to write anything into it and they're not trying to explain it out in the dialogue you either get it or you don't right so I, that's what i think makes it kind of an interesting uh, scene in a movie um because a lot of folks who watch the movie just you know uh they can take it at face value but not really think about it in the context of what was really at stake for the proprietor until you get much further into the film Okay. Any thoughts on that at all? I'm just trying to expose you to some, you know, some actual dialogue from a film and let you see how you know, mechanically it plays out and what possibly might be going on from a filmmaker's point of view. Oh, one other point that I wanted to make. Did you notice anything visually about the scene as it took place? Anybody have any thoughts about the visuals? Do I have any cinematographers in the group today? One thing I noticed was like, there was this time to where whenever they were like going to like the two person shot going back and forth, the camera was kind of zooming in very slowly as they talk more. Then I'll switch to the other person and zoom very slowly in. It was gonna making me get more intense because I thought they was gonna keep zooming in the more they talk. What moment was that? It was right after he flipped the coin and he was telling the man to bet, and he was like, well, I'm betting for her. And so, okay, are you are you one of my cinematography students? I took it before, but not right now. <laughs> are you career-wise, are you moving in a visual direction? What's your direction? What's your discipline ambition? Um, producer. Producer. Well, okay, producer needs to know these things. Producer probably has a strong sense of these things. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, even the opening shot, which is kind of an establishing shot, it's our opening image, right? It's a high crane shot. And what we've kind of come to expect from high crane shots is when they start up high like that, as they, 
they eventually start floating down and they lead us to some other action. You know, they could have taken that whole thing very verbatim and they could have been up high and they could, we could have seen Shiger walking into the building after he finished pumping the gas and we could have kind of floated down. I mean, that, I don't think anybody would have given a second thought to that interpretation of the visual, but they don't do that. They leave the camera locked up there up high. So visually, I think maybe what they're trying to say is, well, they are trying to say something as opposed to just treating it as a, a floaty crane shot and giving us the obvious low hanging fruit, which would be a shot of Shiger walking into the room. Because we don't see Shiger walk into the gas station. We just sort of hear it off camera and then he walks into the frame. So I think what they're trying to establish there visually, and it's not even really, I mean, you get a small sense of it in the novel we, we get a paragraph of, of what it is and what's going on. Let me go back to it. He crossed the Pecos River north of Sheffield, Texas and took Route 349 south. We don't see any of that. He pulled into the filling station at Sheffield and it was almost dark, a long red twilight with, with doves crossing the highway heading south. He filled his tank. He made some calls. He went in and he, and he uh, went into, he filled his tank and he went into pay. So, we got all that in the novel. What we got in the movie was this static shot. And I think that static shot was gonna drive home. I think what they're trying to say is the proprietor's life is pretty pathetic. In other words, he's, he's lived out in the desert his whole life. He's an old man now. He lives out in a shack behind the gas station. And that's as far as his ambition took him for his whole life. And I think they're making a statement about that. They show us the desert and how barren and empty it is, how hot and dry it is. And it's in the middle of nowhere, right? It's far from civilization. It's far from a chaotic life. It's far from, you know, the complex social and, um, you know, vocational activity of human beings. It's in the middle of nowhere. And here comes death, right? So the visuals of the opening shot are interesting. And then the camera is static through most of the exchange until we get to the point where the true conflict is happening. Is he going to choose tails and get shot or not? And that's when the camera starts that subtle, slow push in. And it's just kind of there happening. It just starts moving and it's slow. It's very, very subtle. And that's kind of a visual trick that we use a lot of times when we move the camera. You may see it, you may be, you may be conscious of it happening when it's occurring, uh, or you might not. Um, and if you're not, if it's only if you only notice it in your subconscious, what that move is supposed to translate to is a rising anxiety or a rising tension between these two men. Okay, and that's what it indicates. And if you and if you see it in your in your conscious brain, we've been kind of programmed to understand that a slow creep in on a dolly move like that is a signal to us as the audience that we need to start paying attention to what's being said here because this is very important, right? And it is an important moment because in this moment, we understand something about Anton Chigurh, who is the metaphor for death, which is his process is systematic and it does have rules attached to it. In other words, he doesn't just kill everybody, but this guy stepped into his radar and therefore he had to deal with him. But since he had no context for the proprietor, the proprietor had nothing to do with the money, had nothing to do with the guy he was chasing. He had nothing to do with the events that have set Shiger into motion, but he has to deal with them now because he has entered his field of view. So he says, okay, I'm gonna create the conflict and I'm gonna flip a coin. And if you choose wrong, you're gonna die because that's my job. That's the conflict here in this scene. Right. So the camera starts pushing in. We're supposed to pay attention. In that moment, we learn that Shiger has a process. We also see, you know, it's our first, um, well, it's not our first rise in tension because we see him kill the cop and that's pretty dramatic. But as far as our uh, emotional investment in this proprietor at this point, we learn he's a simple guy. He's a humble guy. He's a nice guy. He's non-assuming. He just lives out back and he runs a gas station. Right. Why does this guy have to die? So we're, we're now wondering, is he going to get it or not? Is he going to get it or not? You know, 
So it's a camera trick that is going to help us do something that isn't present in the dialogue and it's definitely not written down in the novel, right? Not until the end of that scene in the novel do we understand what that coin toss meant uh, because he tells us in expository dialogue in the novel, okay? Expository dialogue in the script is something that we try to avoid as a practice because it's considered lazy writing. If the characters are gonna tell us with their own dialogue what the story is and what's happening, uh, then visually we're not doing our work very well. So keep that in mind when you're creating dialogue as well that your other collaborators are going to have things that they can bring to the table that are going to help enhance the story. You don't have to do it all, right? You need to give us a sense of who these character are, characters are by what they say and how they speak. But you don't have to use tricks like expository dialogue to drive the story point home. There is going to be a visual part of this, which is going to help this narrative in terms of it being a movie or a TV show. Um, and so if you can leave enough clues for a director and an actor and a cameraman to think about so that they can sort of bring what they are concerned with to the table, like Anton choking on the peanut when he hears that the guy married into his situation, that's funny. I thought that was a funny moment, you know, and that's, you know, coming from Javier Bardem. That's his idea of how he can help put a little nuance to this character that's, kind of you know lays sort of threadbare on the page the directors chose not to use any camera movement in this scene until the coin flip and then they decided to use the slow steady creep which is a a visual cue to heighten the anxiety of a scene right otherwise there's no camera movement in this scene at all so there's no direction camera direction in the in the script either in fact the script has next to nothing in terms of action lines it's all slug lines and one-liners of dialogue. There's, there's, there's no, is there anything in here that's two lines? Maybe there's a couple of places where there's actually two lines. A lot of it is one-liners. I mean, it's just bop, 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 back and forth, right? And I think that as well adds to the tension of the scene. Back and forth exchange of one-liners like that. And we we start feeling like or at least i start feeling like my god when are we going to get to the action what's going on here why you know it's slowing down and i you know it's we've changed the pace of the film right now in this exchange and i think all of that is designed to put us on edge no camera movements putting us on edge until we get that little creep and it's at right at the right moment right no movement on the boom down there's really no difference in coverage either. The sizes are virtually the same, back and forth, back and forth. A lot of times in television, we are we're sort of pre-programmed to expect, you know, wide, medium, tight, master shot, close-ups, inserts. We have all these different pieces of coverage that we use to cover a scene, and there's very little of that in this scene at all. We see an insert of the peanut wrapper. We see an insert of the quarter on the on the counter. And that's it as far as inserts. We see an establishing shot that doesn't move. And then it's just two medium close-ups back and forth, bump, 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 bump for five minutes. Any thoughts on any of that? Any reactions to this? Of the people who haven't seen the movie, is any of this making sense? Is any of is any of it resonating with you? I have no um, <laughs> I have no ironic wisdom to reveal to you at this point. What I'm trying to do is just sort of show you a dialogue exchange and get your feelings about it. It's a very I think it's a very intense scene. But I kind of gravitate towards this kind of storytelling anyway. I love the talking head think pieces more than the action films. Um, but I think there's a lot of, um, you know, the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. So like kinetic energy is a rushing stream, right? And potential energy is a slingshot that's been drawn back and held there. The potential energy only can transfer to kinetic energy when you let go of the when you let go of the whatever that thing's called 
that holds the pebble, right? And then swack, the, the, the pebble gets launched across the room, right? Or across the yard or whatever, okay? I think there's a lot of latent energy, potential energy in all this dialogue, right? It's like a moment where we expect, because we saw Shigur violently kill the sheriff in the first scene, right? We saw him kill the guy to steal the station wagon. This is like no big deal for this guy. He's just kind of doing it. And then in this scene, it's like, oh my God, is he going to kill this guy too or not? When's he going to get to it? Why doesn't he just do it? Why is he Why is he asking this guy anything about his life and who he is? He never asked the guy with the station wagon about his life. He never asked the guy in the station wagon whether or not he married into his situation. He didn't ask the sheriff anything. He just killed the sheriff as soon as he got out of the handcuffs. So at this moment, I think this whole thing is designed to stretch it out and just make us so uncomfortable about Anton Chigurh that every time we see him, we're like, oh my God, well, now what's he going to do? What's this guy going to do now? You know, and they're using, they're pulling from everything they can uh, to make you feel that way. The actor's performance, the cameras, the visuals, the, the stripped down dialogue, the fact that there's not a lot of different size shots and things to look at, so they're not distracting us with any photography. It's right back and forth between these two guys. Yeah, I was about to say that I haven't seen the movie, but like throughout the entire dialogue, it was pretty tensioning. Like, um, without the context or anything like that um I was already tense like with that conversation and also at the beginning I was like kind of confused because I didn't know what was going on but then after I had like the context and everything then I understood and I was able to capture those little metaphors like throughout it so it was interesting okay good because what I perceived to be happening um, and I'm not necessarily saying it's happening in this class because I haven't really seen your dialogue yet. Um, what I perceive to be happening is um, a lot of times dialogue in, in student work is sort of uh, being utilized as a means uh, to get the story to move forward or to maneuver a character into a convenient position that, you know, reflects the plot, but they're not really thinking about the characters themselves and the subtext of those characters. And they're not, they're not trying to tell us a story, um, tell us a, a, an underlying thread of a story that's running parallel to the obvious narrative. Right. It's just sort of mechanical and it's utilized in, in a very underutilized way. Um, so I'm trying to get you to think about and avoid that trap, you know, because unnecessary dialogue or superfluous dialogue just adds to the length of something without adding any quality to it. And what what can happen uh, in the editing process is the editors, uh, if the editors are trying to get a story to kind of move along visually and with with dialogue and exposition they do something that we call taking the air out of a scene or taking the air out of an episode which is they'll look for these these long pregnant moments either in dialogue or in the action where not much is happening and they'll trim it out to try and decrease the time between lines of dialogue or decrease the time it takes the car to pull out of the driveway or the, the, the woman to walk across the room and confront the manager of the diner. You know, they'll chop things out here, there and everywhere to, to get these things to be real tight and to run real quick and smooth because of time constraints or because they're thinking about the audience and the yawn factor. You know, this could have been a really boring scene, I think, um, if they'd put in a lot of extra photography and a lot of inserts and a lot of cutaways and stuff. Instead, they they created a real rise in tension by doing next to nothing and 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 just picking cherry picking the best lines of dialogue and turning it into a confrontation. Um, so I'm trying to get you to think about it in those terms so that you don't just create superfluous dialogue. Okay, because superfluous dialogue doesn't really help your story. 
uh, it could bore your audience and an editor might chop it out anyway. So I want you to think about that. So I burned all my time on No Country for Old Men, so I won't show you um, the other, the, uh, the scene from Breaking Bad. Although I think I put it in web courses, the, visio, the video and the transcript. Let's see here. Videos to watch. Yes, okay. Why don't you guys check that out uh, between now and Thursday and we'll talk about it. It's the same kind of scene. It's called Say My Name. It's here under your videos to watch, okay? Check out Say My Name. And then under your downloadable PDFs, the transcript of that scene is available for you to pull off web courses as well. And it's just a transcript, so it's not properly uh, formatted in terms of indents and slug lines and stuff. But here it is, it's the transcript. So it's mostly just the dialogue. There's a couple of action lines in it, but it's mostly just the dialogue. Say my name right here. If you check out those two objects and we can talk about them on Thursday, it's more dialogue. And I think maybe more of you have seen Breaking Bad than have seen No Country for Old Men. So you might have a little bit more uh, prior knowledge and background for this scene. If you don't, I can give you a quick uh, rundown of what's happening when we talk about it on Thursday. Uh, okay, so this is a good place to stop because it's it's three o'clock. So any questions, any issues, any problems, anything you want to discuss really quick before we adjourn? I have like a like a one-on-one -on -one comment. Yeah. It doesn't have to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's just something that's more specific, less generalized. Um, regarding what we were talking about earlier with the second half of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, something that could work is um, what if instead of redoing the same documents over again, we kind of compiled them into like a Bible for our yeah. series? I think ultimately that's what I'm trying to get you to do is I want you to experience this process of these documents, creating them, see how they can help you. And maybe they become part of your process moving forward. Right. And if you're creating a new object in the second half of the semester, you'd want to go through this process again. But now that you know what it is, it's quicker and easier. And, and in a couple of, of the homework assignments, I, I gave you guys some feedback that was essentially talking about the phrasing. Like some of you have filled in that assignment sheet and you've written it kind of like an essay uh, in a full paragraph with full sentences and everything like that. On the beat sheet, I think the phrasing and the tone of that phrasing should feel more like the script so that when you're creating that beat sheet, all these action lines can migrate right over into final draft and become a lot of your action lines in the script. And then all you've got to really do is, uh, you know, fill in your dialogue. Right, so, and so I, I feel like there are going, I mean, I feel like a lot of the people are going to choose to do like a feature link screenplay as their second half of the course. But I know that, I mean, at least Ben and I, and I think there was one other person. Not feature that, length, just dramatically right. constructed. Right, right. But like they're they're going to start on a new project in the second half. Yeah, they're going to start on a different project. But like, I, I think Ben, myself, and someone else wanted to stick with the same project Can confirm. And so like, possibly instead, of, while the other people are creating new documents for their new projects, like new pitches, new dossiers, stuff like that could we possibly refine ours into like a series Bible? Yeah, I think there's room for that because I'm not going to have the same, exactly the same assignments in the second half. Okay, of the okay. So but I think that's where to... Ben and I were confused because it seemed yeah. earlier, like you were saying, we were going to have the exact same assignments. Yeah, that, that's the part that I was concerned about, about developing it again for the second half is just like, I didn't know if we would just be doing the same exact thing for the second one, but just with a new project. And that's where I was concerned being like, well, I can't, if those are the assignments, there's not really a way for me to do the same project without it being like plagiarism. Right. <laughs> um, yes, 
if you're one of those students though that is creating a new document in the second half you're going to need to create new documents i'm not going to have the same number of assignments with the same document assignment in the second half um what i'd rather see in the second half what i'm going to work towards and in constructing the, the latter half of the semester is I want it to be even more workshop related um, because now that you know what a beat sheet is, we don't have to have assignments that have you build one to learn how to do it. You're already going to know how to do it. Um, so the assignments um, are less important in the second half of the semester. And what's more important to me is starting to see you construct your larger body of work and have something new each week to show for to show for it in terms of a workshop opportunity. So I'm yeah. focusing more on writing in the second half of the semester. And in the first half, it's really more about learning all these concepts. I, I think it could even be as simple as like one episode a week or 10 episodes a week or something like that, where we're just building up uh, instead of like making these documents that like are about stuff we've already written, maybe just adding on to our script so that we produce more content. I, right. I feel like that's one way we could go. Just be careful because you're committing to a lot of writing. When you say one episode a week, that's a well, lot. That's why I said one one episode or ten pages or or whatever you think is an appropriate amount per week. I'm really asking for like, I, I think in the the second project it's like twenty or thirty pages, and the first project yeah. was six to twelve pages. I, um, you're so what I'm gathering from this is and that you're weeks. sorry. Yeah. The, there's six weeks after the midterm, so. Right. You know, and so, so what I'm gathering pages, from, the, from this conversation, pages. so what I'm gathering from this conversation is that for people with like Ben and I, who have a kind of unique situation and that we're kind of a little bit later in the process mm -hmm. than some other people, where That's Ben and I have already better. developed some other projects on our own, that you're willing to work with us to make yeah. sure yeah, that am. we're developing what we need to be developing. Yes, I am. Um, Thank yeah. you. Um, Thank you that. So that you know, you know, there's no reason to penalize somebody who's advanced in the class by making you go back and do a bunch of redundant stuff. I want you to be able to get something out of this too. So I'll work with you in that respect, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My my concern was just like I've I've done so many like starts of projects. I feel like it'd be more it, for this class. It might be more worthwhile for me to instead of doing the start of something new just continue on and and finish and develop something that yeah. like is longer term like not necessarily a feature but in in terms of a series was it you that mentioned plagiarism yeah i mean like yeah. that was just like i can't just yeah. resubmit the same assignments uh, like okay. the same documents let me tell you how i feel about that okay yeah. i don't understand how i could plagiarize my own work if it's my work to begin with and i haven't committed plagiarism by definition definition yeah. of plagiarism would be if i took someone else's work and assigned myself credit for doing that work yeah i think I, I would you by the ucf so in that respect i don't think you could plagiarize from yourself now having said that i know there are instructors that want to see you create new documents every every time you have an assignment but in the case of this class and the way the assignments progress and the documents progress and evolve if you start with an uh, with a concept and you want to follow through with it, I'm okay with it. And that would include, I think, to to some extent, prior written work. Now, the only time that I would have a problem would be if all you were doing was resubmitting completed assignments and they weren't modified, improved, or evolved in any way. Then it's kind of a waste of everybody's time for you to submit that kind that of. That makes work. sense. Yeah, like if you uh, have a sh thing you've been working on over a couple of different classes and it keeps getting better and you keep revising and you keep improving and you can show the evolution of that work, I'm fine with that. The, the series that I'm doing, I've kind of had this idea for a while and I wrote up a pilot just like a not for an assignment, just like as a personal project. Mm -hmm. But like looking back at it, I'm like, I might keep some of the same like baseline, but I'm definitely going to be like rewriting it. Because like just with the the new information I've gotten and the new like development that I have. Yeah. And really this is you're kind of under your own recognizance, right? Because how am I gonna know anyway? You know, mm -hmm. if you you know, if there was a document unless I go to all your other writing teachers and say, What did Sean and Ben turn into you last semester? I want copies of everything so I can compare. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing yeah. that. It's too much work. Yeah, and I'm not, that's not the point. What you need to learn 
And hopefully what you'll learn through your own recognizance and your own honest approach to your, to your, to your work is that revision is key, man. Every time you edit something and you fine tune it and you, you let it marinate for a semester or a couple of weeks and you go back to it and you hit it with fresh eyes, you'll see ways that you can improve this work. And every time you do it, the work gets better and better and better. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's really the point. So if, if you can tell me that you're doing that and you're experiencing that kind of evolutionary revelation in your own work, man, I don't care if you wrote it last semester, you know, okay. as also, long as you're showing progress. Yeah. Just to elaborate a little bit more on why specifically I, I wanted to continue this project. It's because like, I have a, a like secret twist villain that comes in partway through the season. And I feel like I like, and I even wrote that for my character dossier for my antagonist, but like, you're never going to see that if I just write the pilot, you know? So like, I wanted to like, I have this idea for an overarching story. So that's why I wanted to continue it on through the rest of the semester. Man, if you have something you're really inspired to write about, um, then let's, let's pursue that. Uh, the last thing I want yeah, to my- have you do something you don't care to write and then your own work gets back burnered and, you know, and then you lose your inspiration over a semester and then you don't reapproach that work. I would hate to do that. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm working. And then mine is, my situation is kind of similar in that I've written three feature like screenplays at this point, like okay. three films, okay. you would say. And so I'm trying to kind of trying to diversify my portfolio. And yeah. I really like this idea I'm working with and okay. I wanted to develop it basically. Great. Great. That's all good stuff. That's all good stuff. All right. All right. Well, thank uh, you, Professor Walker. I was actually going to ask, that. Um, can we do some of the assignments late? Because I forgot about the discussion post until you mentioned it because it didn't show up on the dashboard. Or do you not take late assignments? I'm being pretty liberal about that. You know, So if, if you missed a discussion post, um, if for some reason you can't submit to the assignment because it has the windows closed on web courses, uh, just send it through the web courses email to me, you know, put it in a, uh, you know, in a um, word doc or something and, and attach it and, and then I'll apply it. The only thing that you lose out on by, you know, a, you know, going into an old discussion is nobody's going to give you any feedback because nobody's looking backward at those past assignments. Once, once they're done, they're done. So you've lost the benefit of feedback from your colleagues. Yeah, yeah, I like, I mean, like, I submitted, like, my work. I just forgot to respond to two people. In the oh. discussions. Well, like, yeah, you know, again, you could respond to them, but they're not, you know, I don't know if they're going to see it, if they'll get flagged and go back and look at it or not. Um, so if it's feedback that they could have used to improve an assignment that they've now already turned in, it's kind of after the fact, you know. Okay, I'd yeah. say, you know, I mean... Did you get, are we the only ones on here now? Did you get a seven on that? Um, it was for the beat sheets. So I don't think you graded that yet. I think if you submit your own thing, but you don't respond, I think I, I give that a seven. Oh, okay. And in all the right. cont- in the context of the, 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 f- the first half of the semester, all your assignments add up to like one 100% value. So one seven amongst nine other assignments is just not going to account for much in terms of a total point reduction. I wouldn't worry about it. If you already turned in your document, you just didn't respond to anybody. You probably got a seven because that's my normal MO. And I know I would just move on from that because nobody, if you respond now, they're not going to get your feedback unless they go backwards and look at the assignment again, which they're probably not going to do. All right. cool. All right. That's it then. Thank you. Okay. See you next uh, Thursday. See you. Okay. Bye.